This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading. This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to be back with you on this beautiful Monday morning. And today I'm joined by the wonderful Joanne Harris from Guildford Garden Centre. Joanne, it's great to have you with us. Thanks, Trevor. It's great to be here. Good morning, everybody. Now, we've got a fantastic show for you today. Here's what's coming up. Today I'll be I'll make your life a little bit easier. I've got, got a, a, a no-fuss fertiliser, I suppose. It's one of those fertilisers that's changed the world of gardening. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. We've got uh, a friend of the show and all round nice guy, David Van Berkel. He is a great guy and he's joining us a little bit later on with a fantastic offer just for this show. So you don't want to miss this one. And Jo will be sharing her plant of the week, which will be fantastic. Now, if you've got any gardening questions or queries, all you have to do is post them in the comments line. And remember, make sure you include your suburb, your state, and also make sure you hit the like button because it shares it with your friends and it means that we can all participate and they'll benefit from maybe some of the questions and answers that are happening as well. We've got some great prizes to give away as always, but this week <clears throat> it will have our standard beautiful Fothergill seeds and now it's time to be planting lots of seeds yep. in the garden, particularly those veggie seeds. But we've got a cup a couple of these which i'll talk about that a bit later on but it's osmocote and it's osmocote for pots planters and indoors and indoors are massive but also now is the time to be getting active with your pots and your planters and we might talk about that a little bit later on yeah. um also uh what else we've got well, we've got to have you sending in your questions and we will answer them, won't we, Jo? We will endeavour to answer all of them. And we've got a good one coming in straight away. Uh, Georgina in Melbourne. Actually, Georgina sent us a couple of photographs and I need some I need some advice. This is a little bit of the bigger picture kind of thing. So she's got beautiful gates in the front of a property and uh, she'd like to plant two big trees on each side. Now, I love the autumn colours of the maples, but I'm not sure. Could you please recommend a few ideas for me? I'll send some pics of the gates, which, uh, which we, we can see here. I'm not sure whether they're up on screen or not, no. But um, beautiful stately gates. And it's one of those things where you're looking for something that really is um, you know, structurally strong yeah. and beautiful, but certain times of the year that stands out. And uh, you mentioned maples. I've got one, Fairview Flame, which I think is absolutely gorgeous that I have in my own garden. Now, I'm not using them in that sense, but they look fantastic. What do you oh, reckon? Oh, the colour. The colour's fantastic mm -hmm. in the in the Fairview Flame. Um, and they are a majestic tree. And I guess with gates like that, you need a majestic tree. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, the thing is, come autumn mm -hmm. time, once they start colouring up, 
it is just mind-blowingly beautiful. And, and the, the yeah. colour in Melbourne would be stunning. Mm, you know, yeah. a little bit more cold that when we get, that would be fantastic. So I think think maybe mm. uh, because Joe and I are over here in mm. Perth and I'm lucky I live in the hills and it gets a lot cooler there, so I'm able to grow these quite well. Yeah. But they're never quite the same as they are, I think, in Melbourne. And, and of course, you have to understand that the origins of these trees is actually the, the, the forests of Canada. And um, whilst these may be selections, improvements on some of the colour of these, um, the forests of Canada are just incredible oh. to walk through when yes. they colour up. So if you could recreate that at the front entrance to your house. Yeah. Wow. Just we used awesome. to collect their leaves when I was a kid. I grew up in Canada mm. and uh, or spent some time there and we used to collect them and wax the leaves. Ah, yeah, to keep and maintain the colour. It was fantastic. They're beautiful. Mm. So great thing for the kids and the crane goods too. Yeah. One, yeah. Of, one of the nicest photos, I've taken photos all over the world and one of the nicest photos I've ever taken is the Canadian maple leaves when they fall and they fall into a stream and you've got the reflection and of them in the float. water yeah. and oh gee whiz. Yeah. Yeah. Just magnificent. Stunning. There so, yeah, I think that would be a great, great choice. Hopefully that helps, Georgina. Yeah. Let's move on to Gay and Locker. Okay. So, Gay. Um, Gay uh, has some gazanias and they've changed colour. So, she's planted various colours and then over the years they've changed and become the same colour. Um, and I, and she's confused by it, which is confusing. And I think what you've got to remember is that a plant like gazania will often revert back to the parent plant. Um, so that's possibly what you've done. So I guess the um, the the solution to that, get down to your garden centre and buy some more, actually. Yeah. yeah. So don't be scared to mix it up a little bit. Yeah. You know, go and get a few different ones. Gazanias do have a habit of um, the strongest. The, it's always a particular colour is always the strongest. Yeah. It eventually overwhelms the others. So yes. that you end up just yeah. seeing that particular colour. A bit like a variegated plant can change back to green. Mm. So it's the same thing. So get down there. It's The garden centres here in Perth are full of them at the moment. So I imagine the same will be in New South Wales. So Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully that helps uh, Gay. Now, um, Jennifer, I'm not sure where you're from, Jennifer, but I reckon we can help with this particular problem. I've got a big, deep pot with a frangipani in it. It's starving for nutrition. How can I make it happy without repotting it? And um, it's kind of like a segue into this. I'll talk about this a bit later on. But this is Osmocote designed specifically for pots and controlled release fertilizers. I think in pots are the yeah. only way to go. They really do make a big difference. So hang on there. I'll talk about that a little bit, bit later. A couple of things though with frangipanis. Um, interesting plant. Now they should be pretty much dormant. So you should be starting yeah. to see maybe a little bit of leaf development um, right out the top of the stems, but that, that's pretty much all you're going to get. But if you give them a really high nitrogen fertilizer now, you'll end up with a problem when it comes to flowering. You won't get as much flower as you would have done. Yeah. You'll get lots and lots of foliage and lots of growth. And this is good if you're trying to get a plant to get, get established, to get growing, to get structure and size, but it's no good if you want to see lots of flowers. So um, the type of fertilizer you use is also very, very important. You do want to use those flower promoting fertilizers. And typically they're the ones that are more of the K. So when you're looking at that NPK, you want to make, be looking for more of the K if you can. So a little bit of advice there. And I guess also um, a lot of people um, don't have the time or even maybe the ability to repot a plant. Mm. So using um, a soil in, uh, enhancer also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they're a big thing these days. They, they really they? are. Mm. And I think that it, it can um, just make it a little bit easier for you rather than having to repot every year like we used to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's become a thing. And it's it, like I think when I first got into horticulture as a, as a young guy, um, we were very uh, agronomy driven. So we were sort of very much about the, the core elements. So nitrogen, yes. phosphorus, potassium. There'd be fertilizer blends and mixes, but predominantly we were throwing down superphosphate or urea and all these you know, very core element sort of fertilizers. Yeah. And it's completely changed now. Yeah. We don't actually look at fertilizing the plant. We actually look at feeding the soil. That's right. And so Absolutely. that's what these new um, yeah. these new blends do is that they're a mixture of microbes that get into the soil and make sure that it's brought to life because there should be billions of microbes in every handful of soil that you've got. Yeah. And if you've got the right ones, then your plants it really will be helps. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And and to reintroduce those in also once if you have a really heavy rain incursion or a really hot incursion, mm -hmm. it's important to replace those as well. Absolutely.
Yeah. All right. So let's um, let's keep rolling along, Joe. We've got Liz. So Liz is in Meadowbank, Sydney, and um, she has jonquils and freesias, and they're at the end of the flowering. Um, and she wants to the best chance for them flowering next year. So my tip for you would be is when they're dying down to feed them and to because uh, that's when the bulb decides what the flowers they're going to have mm -hmm. next year. So give them a good liquid feed um, with a good balanced fertiliser um, as they're dying. And I usually do it half strength once a week for about three weeks while they're okay. dying down. Good advice. And I don't cut off the tops. They can look a little bit ugly, but let them die down. Let them draw all the nutrients back down into the bowl. Yep. And then you're more assured of having good flowers next year as well. Yeah. And so I think, good luck with that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think with Meadowbank too, you'd find jonquils and freesias should bounce back um, every year without any chilling or anything like that. So no. they should be fine. What um, What is the key and what Joe's basically said is you want those bulbs to be as big as you can. And once they've finished flowering, particularly if you pinched the seed head off the top of the of the stem, the flower stem, yes. um, all the energy goes into the foliage, all the energy then goes back down into the bulb and you end up with the biggest possible bulb, which is your best possible chance of getting lots of flowers. So it's best to pinch the seed out, right? Yeah, it always yeah, is. Otherwise, they put the energy into the into seed. Into the seed rather than the yeah. flower. So the it's, plant. it's yeah. one way that you yeah. get them to push it back into the bulb and get it established. All right, yeah. let's keep moving along. Kristen is in Melbourne. Mm. Hello, I've got a large, well-established mm. protea bush that's flowered well over the winter and spring, but now there is no new growth, unlike any other proteas or my other proteas. And firstly, um, the leaves firstly turn yellow and now brown. Spray the entire bush with Yates anti-rot fungicide to no mm. avail. Now, I'm not sure whether Yates anti-rot would be the, um, no. the key to that particular problem, because um, if, if it is a fungal problem, um, and when you say it's well established, one of the things that proteas tend to do when they're a bit older is when they've had had, uh, had, enough. had enough, they just give up the ghosts and they literally all die off. So it's possible that, that maybe it's just come to the end of its life. Um, Yates anti rocks good for um, soil based fungal problems. But if you're but getting not, a foliage, yeah. is there anything in the garden centre that you would normally recommend? Yes, there is. Um, uh, well, I always go towards a mangazeb to start yeah, with yep. you know it's it's almost like that one that will cover a whole bunch of different fungicides so i guess mangazeb would be something that i would try but i'm a little bit with you when she says well established how old are those proteas yeah. are they at the point where they are going to say goodbye and again you might need to replace them um, mm. but yeah try <clears throat> excuse me try a, a spray of mangazeb but don't just do it once do it twice yep yeah. Okay, a couple of weeks yeah. after? Two weeks after is what mm -hmm. I usually do, 10 to 14 days afterwards, okay. um, and then see how that goes. So good luck with that, Kirsten. I hope it goes well. Mm. Now we've got Rebecca in Melbourne. Yeah, okay, Rebecca. And you've got elephant ears in your garden in the full sun position. Will they stay green and gorgeous all year round? Look, um, it's difficult to say, uh, Rebecca. It depends on where you have them in your garden and what the environment is. I know that I couldn't grow them in my garden. I'm on the top of a hill with a lot of hot wind and not a lot of water in the garden. And I try and grow a, um, a garden that is uh, much more um, water-wise mm. uh, for our Perth conditions. Yep. Whereas I know that Trevor's in the hills and you've got one down by your creek. Mm. So it's getting lots of water. It's got a different micro environment, yeah. which will, will help it. And that's the key is the microclimate that you've got. So often yeah. in a suburban situation, um, lots of houses are on the outside, um, smaller blocks. Yeah. If you're on this, if it's facing the south side, um, it's going to be protected from the worst of the summer. So it's not going yeah. to suffer burning during summer, which is probably one thing to think about. I find with mine, if I get a few frosts come through, they'll, they'll yellow. Yes. and uh, they, they don't look really good for a period of time. It's kind of this period, this next sort of three month period when they really come into their own, they put a lot of growth out. So now's the time to be feeding them. And I think that if you're giving them a controlled release fertilizer again, you're gonna find good, strong, steady growth. Yes. And that should do the best yeah. you can. So yeah, it's it gets down to that location, Joanne. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Rebecca. So hopefully that fixes that. Yeah. Now I've got Kay staying in Melbourne. Um, need some advice to get rid of black spots on nectarine trees. What do you reckon the black spots might be? Well, it could be a fungal um, mm. thing. Um, it's like shot hole. It's like a shot hole, mm. um, but it could also just be a fungal. Um, at Melbourne, I'm not sure what sort of um, 
rain you've had like we had this year. We're seeing a lot of it at the garden mm -hmm. centre. So July for us here in Perth, we had three days, I think it was, that didn't rain. Didn't rain. Yep. Um, and so Phenomenal. there's a lot of natural things. People are, I'm saying it's overwatered. Um, people are saying, no, we didn't water it, but it was the, the natural water. So if you've got a lot, it might just be a fungal issue and you need to watch if you're in a heavy soil, make sure that you've got um, some gypsum on it, that yep. you've got well drained. So it's got more chance of, of the, the soil being moist, but not uh, clogging up the soil, and which would cause it. You mentioned Mancozeb earlier on. Mancozeb would be the fungal solution for yeah, this. And it does tend to take definitely. some of those bacterial spots out as well. So um, probably the, the only thing you could really do now, apart from encouraging fresh new growth. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, get some mulch on them, get some good fertiliser on them as we're coming into spring or into summer. Um, and I'm sure they'll come through with it. They're pretty tough things, nectarine trees. Mm, they yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think um, on the weekend we had a session here in WA and uh, there were a number of people that, you know, that wrote in about peach leaf curl. And uh, here in WA, because we had a very, very wet July, humidity levels have actually been quite yeah. high. And um, peach leaf curl, it's not an uncommon thing to get it. It's actually pretty common to see at this time of the year. But yeah. one of the things is... Um, you don't treat it now. You, it really does need a copper-based spray or copper sulfur spray, mm -hmm. ideally. And both of those shouldn't be applied as soon as the new growth no. have, have appeared. So the trick will really be next autumn is to apply one of those, something like Coside or or the good old, um, or once upon Just a time board. Just oxychloride. Yeah, they're really yeah. good ways yeah. to clean up those fungal yeah. and bacterial infections. So you're looking at leaf drop. And then again, do it again mm -hmm. at leaf bud just before the plant um, bursts open again. And you'll find that your tree will be a lot healthier. But you're right, um, peach leaf curl has been predominant through it's here been, too. It's been a big and thing. you've got it in all young trees. It's usually mm. you've got a little bit of it. Yep. And I know that when we receive the trees, so let's say from Flemings, they spray them before they come to us. And we'll often spray them again. Yep. Uh, but this year it has just been all through. Yeah. It looks pretty ugly on a tree, but it doesn't last. They so grow, they grow okay. out of it, which is the yeah, important thing. So I, I, I was providing some advice for somebody who didn't mm -hmm. want to use a spray, which is very, very hard. But the advice, best advice you can get is take a plastic bag out, break all the leaves off that are twisted yep. and null, take them away so they don't drop on the ground. You don't end up with any more spore set in around the base. So yeah. you can try and reduce it that way. And, and generally yeah. that's kind of, kind of and okay. And I think with a healthy tree, um, if you keep that tree really healthy with the correct amount of um, fertiliser and good mulch, et cetera, and the correct amount of water, they will grow out of a lot of that. They do, yeah. The stronger, healthier tree, can't yep. go wrong. Now, we've got to keep moving because mm. Michaela is pushing us along really hard okay. this morning. There's All lots right. of questions coming in. So Amanda from Bathurst, um, she has some tulips that she's moving out of their pots and mm. she wants to put in canna, li canna lily. Calla lilies. Sorry, calla lilies that she bought from Garden Express. Um, can I um, augment the rich potting soil in the tulips we're in? Can she reuse it? Is it, uh, it is beautiful and rich and they're in very big pots, too heavy for me to lift. What mix should I get? Mm. Well, I would just use a good uh, premium potting mix, really. Mm. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to say with that is the very big pots, if you're, if you are moving into doing something like this and um, having something similar to what Amanda's got, um, consider some of the lightweight pots these days. Yeah. They, you know, you, you need go on, big pots for things. Mm. So go for a lightweight pot and it helps you be able to move them around, etc. But quite honestly, Amanda, I would probably just use a good quality potting mix. And we, we did mention before um, about mm. um, being able to put in some microbes into the soil. One yeah. of the great fertilizers that I've used over the years um, that was developed here for very, very poor quality soils was Traforte yes. and Traforte M's got microbes in it so maybe that's something you could use yeah. as well um, certainly adding nutrient is going to be very important so whether you use something like that or you use uh, Osmocote um, they're both really good fertilizers to stimulate good growth now remember yeah. hit the like button if you like what we're saying and doing Tash has written in, I'm not sure where you're from, Tash, but you've asked a pretty good question. What's the most natural product I can use to get rid of aphids? Well, right at the moment, the most important thing to do is to try and keep those populations down. What some people do is they get the hose out and wash them off, and generally that will knock them around a fair bit. But, you know, chilli garlic spray is a fantastic thing. Yeah. You can make up your own. Mm. You don't need mm. to necessarily buy it pre-mixed, but you can. 
and just spray that over the foliage. And it does two things. The chili will actually kill um, the younger aphids off. And the, the big thing is that the garlic will repel them. And garlic, you know, was used to get rid of vampires in the old days. Well, guess what? <laughs> aphids, aphids are. aphids today. Yeah, <laughs> aphids are suckers too. So And you won't have any vampires. There you go. So yeah. you can't go wrong. So yeah. I would say the chili garlic spray. Yeah, cool. So Valerie, um, she started a new garden bed where there used to be lawn and was wondering if there was a way to stop grass from growing in the garden bed. Um, she has new plants in there and has mulched the garden bed well. Um, I tend to, let's just go back a step from there. I tend to, if I'm going to remove grass, I'll remove grass and then what I'll do is I'll feed that area and in, in, encourage whatever grass or regrowth. weeds are le left, the regrowth. And then I'll spray again for that or remove whichever uh, method you're going to use. Um, but I guess with um, having the, the plants already in there, there are some, um, uh, some uh, I've gone completely blank. There are <laughs> some um, selective herbicides, herbicides, yeah. selective herbicides yeah. that you could use. Um, but I guess if you're not into using sprays of any sort, the best thing to do is go out there with a cup of tea in one hand and a, uh, a fork yeah. in the other hand and yeah. just um, be patient and get rid of them that way and keep an eye on it because they can take off. Certain grasses can take off and then it's really hard. You've yeah. almost got to lift the new plants Com out to get rid of them. Commercially, my landscape team, they use a product called Fusilade. Yes. It's, um, it's, it's a very interesting selective herbicide that only kills grasses. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's not something, it's, it's quite quite a um, it's quite a poisonous kind of product. So you have to be very careful how you apply it. And the best thing to do is to go to your local gyms or one of those professional mowing organisations yeah. and ask them, because generally they've got licensed contractors who can actually come and spray that out for you. Yeah. And once it's sprayed, it kills all the way down the stem. So whether you've got cooch, you know, buffalo is pretty easy to pull out, but if you've got cooch or kai that they've got deep runners, you do need to kill down as far as you it can. It is good stuff for that. Yeah. You've just got to protect yourself. You know, and I cover my arms and hands the yeah. whole lot with it. Um, There's so a lot of rules. Never spray on a windy day. That's right. Never spray when it's too yeah. hot. So that's yeah. why getting the experts in on something like this is yeah. probably a good way to go. Yeah. Fusilite, well, of course, doesn't um, affect most of the other plants that are in there. That's the beauty of it. Only kills grasses. That's right. So mm. you can spray it over things and it doesn't have any effect on yeah. it. Yeah. Now, Liquid Blue contacted us via YouTube. You're in Sydney's east. Got a bonsai, chamois cypress of Chusanana. Now, the foliage has gone from lush dark green to a pale greyish green. Should I cut off most of the growth? Is it too much water or light? It could be actually cold and a lack of nutrient, I would think. Giving it a little bit of a prune because it's a bonsai, yeah. lightly pruning it will probably do a good job and a little bit of fertiliser will stimulate that growth. You don't want to put too much on, but you do want to bring that colour back into it. Should we go stay in Sydney and go to Susan? Yeah. Would you use um, maybe something more like just a, um... no, it's all right. Oh, so, look, <laughs> you know, when you think about yeah. it, so, so I'm, I'm a big fan of controlled release fertilisers. That's what I was going to say. But, but yeah. um, in but, this, if you want to get an instant response, yeah. sometimes a liquid fertiliser is also Yeah, good. that's what I was going to say. And then I thought mm. perhaps not because it was, I don't know enough about bonsais to mm. really answer that question. Just got to be a bit careful yeah. with the, the nutrient because it's very small don't soil base. Yeah. yeah. Shall we go to Susan? Yeah, so Susan, um, she just bought her first tomato seedlings. Good on you, Susan. I was going to put them in a big pot on a covered patio. Do they need sunlight or et cetera? Will they be okay in the patio? Look, they'll be okay in the patio if you've got at least four hours sunlight, but they do need some good sunlight. So I'd probably be more inclined. Keep them on the edge of the, the patio perhaps where mm. they get some good sunlight um, because otherwise they're not going to grow as well for you, Susan. Mm. You Look, tomatoes are remarkably productive at the best of times but yeah. if you can get them into the ideal scenario you'll end up with really good crops now we'll move up to the sunshine coast in queensland nicole's contacted us my pride of india has just lost all its leaves is this normal as i thought this would happen in spring so the pride of india is lagostromia speciosa it's a member of the crepe myrtle family but a beautiful tree with magnificent um, mauve purple flowers yes one of my favorites um it does lose its leaves um, and it does at the end of winter going into spring, which is very unusual. So um, believe it or not, it's okay. You shouldn't have a problem here. Um, what you will find is the turnaround's quite quick. So as soon as the weather warms back up again, 
it'll really start to um, to take off. So don't panic, Nicole. It should all be good. Um, this is just Mother Nature doing her thing and this is the plant having a rest. All right, Joe. how about we talk about your plant of the week because this is a ripper. I love this one. So this is a new release, Trevor, um, and I'm going to put it really close, maybe in between us, so that you can see, see the, the foliage. The foliage. Mm. So the foliage is this beautiful green with the white margins, but what I love about it the most also is the dark black stems that it's got. So it's a pittosporum something that you'll find you can grow um, much easier in perhaps the east coast than what you can here in Perth. Um, we do sell quite a few of these to people in Perth, but we try and make sure that they're in a uh, in an area where they're not getting the hot easterly winds. So There, there is something pretty special about this one, though, because we've had um, varieties like Sir James Sterling and so on in the past that are variegated, but none of them have got the black stems yeah. like this. This is yeah. unique. It's stunning, isn't it? it? I'll, I'll try can and you see pop if you can that get up it? to the camera. Can you see how black those stems are? And what that does is it makes that silver variegation of the foliage just pop. Standouts. I've never seen anything yeah. with black stems quite like yeah. that. Now this, um, if you prune a pittosporum, and it says that you need to prune it often, but in, to keep it nice and bushy, but in fact, really just three times a year is what they're suggesting um, to prune it. So it's not a high maintenance no. plant either, but to keep it really nice and bushy. Um, it grows to about three metres by only one metre. Right. So it makes a perfect screen also. It's not mm. like a lot of things that grow three metres want to also grow three metres wide, wide. Yeah, this is and then you've got a lot of maintenance about it. So, um, yeah, this is, um, I love this one full and sun? I think it's worth, it will take full sun, um, especially in the eastern states mm -hmm. will have full sun. I think full sun is fine. I think the main thing with this one for here in Perth is the hot easterly winds. Okay. That's what's going to really damage it. Okay. So as long as you've got it in a more protective position, yep. um, you're so yeah, okay. if you're in, uh, in Melbourne or you're in Sydney in the suburbs with a smaller sort of garden size and you're yeah. looking for a wonderful screen to go against a fence, this has got to be probably one of the better plants you're going to be able to yeah. use because you will have the protection from, from hot winds, um, should yes. allow it to sort yeah. of establish quite quickly. I think it would be going. perfect for the, for the east and um, just have to be careful here where you put it. Uh, but it's also a fast grower. Mm. So it's not, you know, you can put in a plant this size and you'll have a decent size hedge in a couple of years. Awesome. Perhaps not three metres, but a decent size yeah. hedge. It's worth, and it's out now. It's a new release. There's not a lot that you can find on the internet. I, I went on trying to get a little bit more information, but it's that new that it's there's not a lot out there for it yet. And you um, probably can get some information from um, the Guildford Garden Centre. Well, you... Uh, from our website, from your you website, can. Right. Um, it's not a, again, we actually haven't got a huge amount. I uh -huh. need to go in and do a little bit of research and try and contact the um, the grower of it so that I can get some more information. Oh, right. But um, yeah, okay. get down to your garden centre. It's of the a week. new release and I, I reckon they'll all have it out there. If they don't, tell them they should. Okay, folks. Now, look, we'll keep flying with questions because there's lots coming through. Make sure you do tell us where you're from and remember, hit the like button. If you like what you're seeing, if you like the questions that are being answered, you want to ask about something else, ask the question, hit the like button, share it with your friends, the more the merrier. Okay, we're going to go to Scott in Beaconsfield in Melbourne. I have two ferns I was given from a friend. I transplanted them into my garden with root ball attached. At first, the ferns were fine, but now they're not growing. My soil is heavy clay soil. Mm -hmm. What can I do to bring them back? All right. Well, in Melbourne, there is one thing that with the heavier soils that everybody does over there that gets great results is to use clay breaker. Now, clay yeah. breaker is generally a liquid gypsum, so it's a form of calcium or, 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 or a lime, but it's not going to um, – it's, it's pH neutral, so it's not going to change the pH of your soil. And if you can mix that into the soil, that's going to assist in opening the soil up just a little bit. Now, ferns generally don't mind it being the soil being relatively sort of heavy. They quite like that moisture. But if it's been really cold, you'll find that sometimes they will sit until the weather starts to warm. And once we start getting these nice warm days that we are getting, um, you should see new growth come back. Now, if you're not seeing that, that's where you need to go. And definitely with ferns, you either do one or two things. It's a controlled release fertiliser or you use something else and you use fish emulsion. And fish emulsion is mm. always a good way with ferns to get really good growth. It's been one of those particular types of fertilisers that when you apply them over the years, it just gets really good results out of the members of the fern family. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. Shall we go to Sydney? 
Sydney and Marina, she has neighbours that have been feeding the local cockatoos for a couple of years now. And whenever she has plants flowering or new lemons uh, in on her lemon trees, the birds and the neighbours' cats come in and strip the plants. Oh, good grief. So, of course, the cats are coming in for the birds, not mm -hmm. for the, the fruit. But yeah. any ideas to keep the birds and cats away without having to cover anything? Well, netting is a good way, of course, to keep the birds away. Um, there are, it's I don't know, birds. I mean, they, a lot of the birds too, especially cockatoos, um, are pretty clever birds, mm. right? Mm. So uh, once upon a time, you'd often see... Um, uh, discs, you know, the old CD discs mm. hanging in or something shiny and moving to to um, to help keep the birds away. But the cockatoos get used to it and they know what to do. Mm. So they end, enter the other side of the tree around from where they aren't. So I'm not sure. What would you, Do you get lots of um, birds up where you yeah, are? Yeah, I do. In fact, um, on the weekend, I've had the red-tailed black cockatoos um, oh. stripping all the nuts off of all the, the beautiful um, gum trees that have around the outside of my property. Yes. Um, and what they do is we've got little pears just developing and stuff. When they get tired of those, they'll come they just, down and have a shot of the pears. They nip them off, So they? Yeah, so what we do is we spray, uh, to, believe it or not, it's white pepper, and chili, and it's a really, really hot chili, and we literally just spray it over the foliage of the plants, and, um, helps. and they won't go anywhere near it. So it keeps okay. the birds away, and this applies to pretty much all of the parrots. It's, it doesn't work with any of the honey eaters or any of those other insect catching birds. They don't seem to be any. You know, they're not really eating the fruit. No, it's the birds that eat the fruit that. That does knock it around a bit so um and hopefully if there's less birds the cats won't be encouraged to come you in won't also. see cats yeah 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 and yeah. and believe it or not um the pepper is really good for for possums and for cats so they kind of sniff oh. it and they start sneezing and they'll go somewhere where it's not upsetting their their because they've got very sensitive noses yes. so once you've done that they kind of move away okay we'll keep moving on because michaela's pushing us really hard this morning i don't really I can know see that oh she's ruthless um <laughs> shirley is on the gold coast hello shirley i've lost quite a few allen magic plants from curl grub i'm not sure what an allen magic plant is um allen magic is a form of uh, hedging plant, mm -hmm. um, not a sagesium. It's and you get the curl grub in it, right. wondering how to revitalise the remaining plants. Her issue is curl grub. So mm -hmm. um, and curl grub can be a really big problem in Queensland this time of the year. Now there are some there are some treatments that you can buy that are drenches. So um, what you want to do is head into your local garden centre. Um, mention that you're looking for the drench um there's a couple there's two from yates um, there's probably a couple of local ones you'll find up there yeah. that are specifically for the local region um, but what you do need to do is use these drenches on the soil curl grub if if you were in perth where the soil's sandy or you're in the mornington peninsula or the northern beaches um, in yeah. melbourne and sydney what you find is you can just drench the ground and the grubs will come up just towards the end of the day and magpies will come in and clean them up in no time. But when you're when you're in the sort of slightly heavier soils, generally of the Gold Coast, um, and you're getting curl grub in big numbers, it can cause problems. So that's where these drenches come in and do a really good job. Shall we keep moving? What Melton Absolutely. in Victoria? Okay, so Melton um, has a Fuji apple tree, and he wants to know whether he needs to spray that and can he repot it now. Uh, you could repot it now. Um, you're better to repot them in winter time, but I think you're probably still okay to do that. And I'm not sure that you need to spray it for anything. If it's got leaves on it already, there's no need to spray at mm. all. Um, it's only if it's still in bud that you would want to spray. So no, I don't think you need to re, re um, to spray it. You um, do do need to be conscious that if it's got fruit on it and you repot it and yeah. put it into shock, it'll drop the fruit. Yeah, and it'll drop the flower too. Mm. So you've just got to be careful about what time. You're better to do it in wintertime, um, Melton. Now, Amanda's asked me a question. It's probably one that you should be answering, Joe. When are purple fountain grass coming in and can I overwinter them? I'm in a frost area um, in the winter, early spring period. My understanding is you can overwinter them um, and the purple fountain grass grass do you mean when are they coming into flower or when are they coming into the uh, into garden centers mm. i'm a garden center person remember yeah, they <laughs> you're should, asking should... the wrong question they're starting to come into our garden centers now, now. Yeah. Um, and the flower i don't think they flower until 
mid to the end of, of spring yeah. they start flowering yeah so so once um, you're into the summer you should you yeah. should have full flower at that point but i think this is more like when they're coming in and available to be able to, to buy them to, to put in i i, I would take yeah it i way. think yeah so i yeah. think yes you can um you can get them now certainly in perth and i would imagine um, in other states, you'll be able to get them now also. This one's from Ali in Adelaide. Yeah. Hello to everybody in Adelaide. Recently planted a variety of veggie seedlings. Um, put them out into newly bought bulk veggie saw mix. All are demonstrating stunted um, new growth. I think that's new or no growth. Yellow leaves. Yeah. What do you reckon's going on here? And they're getting bashed by insects. Well, they're getting bashed because they're, they're not feeling so great. Mm -hmm. um, so I would think that maybe you need some um a, a good all-round fertilizer on them to help them maybe um mm. you know something with some trace elements in it would be a good idea she's added nitrogen to the soil with little improvement oh okay and and about to try some iron chalates well you could do that but uh I'm not sure why it's um it's happening that way. Other what than I, I fertilizer. would suspect is I think that that was there's a big shortage of good compost right across Australia because ah, everybody's been getting course. into gardening. Yes, of and, course. And and so all the potting mixes and all the good composts have been used for making potting mixes. If you're if you get got your veggie soil mix and it's got a lot of immature organics in them, they're still breaking down. And when they break down, the bacteria that break them down take nitrogen out of the soil. And that the classic example of that is there'll be no growth and of leaves course. turn yellow. Yeah, so, yeah. so my suspicion is that you've got an immature soil that's still still evolving at the moment into a reasonable soil. So the best advice is, and I think Joe's just given it there, is to make sure that you put, a, again, something like it's obviously not this one because this one's specific for yeah, for, uh, pots. for pots but you mm. can get one for veggies herbs and um, seedlings and that's the one you need to get your hands on and i would actually integrate it into the top soil so maybe top 100 mil of soil yeah, i know it seems in. yeah what it seems like a strange thing to do yeah. but it'll ensure that that top level where all those little roots are going have all the nutrients that they need and it, as the bacteria continues and, and fungi continue to break the soil down, um, they'll also have a good supply. So you should see quite a rapid transformation in that soil. But you might see that your crop, your first crop, is maybe not quite as good as you were hoping for. Because yeah. once it sets back, it's hard to turn it around, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Now, Betty's yeah. in Goulburn and she's got lots of leucodendrons growing. When's the best time to cut them back as we get heavy frosts in winter? Well, my rule with with leucodendrons with any of the members of the protea family is when they've finished flowering if i'm going to prune them at that point that's yeah. when i bring them back and i never cut them back too hard so no try and try and third keep, only yeah perfect about a third perfect yeah. advice and, and as soon as they finish flowering yep. don't leave them too much longer yep. and that, yeah and that should do the job betty and just keeps them nice and compact and, and moving along and looking really good um the one thing that you should do is also give them a feed after you prune them because yeah, it will absolutely. encourage a bit of regrowth straight but, away and it needs it um, so we're going to Gloucester in uh, New South Wales, mm -hmm. and they'd like to know what a good fertiliser for um, feeding the strawberries to make them big and healthy. Um, well, one that I really love is Eco Vital. Right. Uh, I, I it. think yeah. it's, oh, it's a fabulous, um, I'll have to bring you some in next time. Yeah. It's a fabulous fertiliser. Um, it's got a lot of fish emulsion in it, yeah. but it's also got um, microbes and and a good so, balance of, of minerals in it too right so it's it's a really good one to go for in the old days um and i don't even know whether you can still get it these days fostrogen was one of the best um fertilizers for strawberries because it was taken in through the foliage and yes. you would see like bigger plumper and also sweeter fruit and it was yeah. designed there was one I think it was a general but it was designed specifically for flowering plants yeah so um it did encourage more flowering yeah. so there's a few options there i Which suppose is the, liquid is the way to go though right well that's yeah liquid is what i was mm. i guess i was getting at and i'm not sure and i'm pretty sure you can get eco vital around australia now too it's a, right it's a really good product okay well there you go yeah. there's a couple of options leanne remember folks hit the like button and when you're sending through your questions make sure you do tell us where you're from it does make a big difference because yeah. we live in such a big country with such diverse um, environments so we've got at least five different climatic zones that we have to consider when we're giving you advice it's really important now i'm just going to go into this product of the week because every week evergreen uh, the love 
love the garden people. Um, they support us with this program and we're very grateful. They have so many good products in their range, but one that is vitally important to apply just at the moment is a controlled release fertilizer um, to your indoor plants, to your potted plants on balconies and to your hanging baskets. And believe it or not, these plants have very specific needs. One of them is that um, when you take a look at this, they, they need consistent steady growth. So this particular product has six months of feeding. They need a higher level of potassium to encourage flowering. They also need trace elements added. And the last thing is that you've got to have the right mix. So you've got to have a good blend. They do need a, a little bit of P in there, so a little bit of phosphorus. And this is really important for root health. So if you've got the mix right, and then you add one more element to that, and that's a wetting agent, your, potting, your potted plants and your hanging baskets, etc., should be absolutely fantastic. But the most important thing, of course, is that that six month feeding. So you only yeah. have to do it once every six months. It's brilliant. So this is great for all sorts of flowering indoor plants, uh, for the big leafy ones that we've got. You know, when you take a look at ficus and dracaenas and all of those, they all love this. But it's also good for things like ferns and orchids. And because it is controlled release, it's safe to use. You don't really need to go and water this in after you put it in. There's no risk of burning the plant or the soil. Um, that's what makes these kinds of fertilisers so good. And Osmocote has been the, the fertiliser that professional growers have relied on for well over 50 yeah. years. And it's because it is safe. It is very well designed to ensure that whatever plants that are, are being grown are getting the right nutrients for the best growth. Now is the time with your indoor plants, with your potted plants, particularly outdoor potted plants. I'm finding all of mine just love being repotted this time of the year. Good potting mix and the right fertiliser. You put the two together, everything will look Success. fantastic. It's as good as that. Yeah. And as I said, you know, when you, yeah. you know, so we often will recommend the Osmocote premium potting mix. So it's got the red ticks, yes. which is always something yeah. you should look for. But the, the interesting thing with the Osmocote potting mix is that it actually has Osmocote in it. So if you're repotting into that and your plant is really, really barren and struggling and needing some love, you might put Add a little bit extra, extra in. Yeah. But the good thing with the potting mix, of course, is that it will be um, something that um, that will carry the Osmocote in it. But this is specifically for pots, really important pots hanging baskets, your favourite indoor plants, they'll all benefit, now's the time to do it. And we will be giving away a tub of the 500 gram and a tub of the one kilo. Um, I will announce this at the end of today's show because Michaela is going to remind me because she's fantastic. <laughs> all right, shall we scroll down a little bit and we'll have a look. Phil's got a question. This is a, this one, Joe might be uh, something that you might want to um, to tackle. A lime tree keeps getting attacked by stink bugs. Bugs are uh, beetles are a different different beast to deal with, aren't they? They are. Um, there's a couple of products out there that I would use, um, and they're usually a systemic product. Mm -hmm. um, Confidor is one of them. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not Confidor. Uh, Congard. Congard. Got Congard, which is very similar to the Confidor. Okay. Which of course you can no longer purchase. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so systemic, I think, is the, the way to go with stink bugs. Um, I also send the grandkids out and they just uh, pick up the, the and grab them all them. for me and collect them. That's kind of good. Um, yeah. Yeah, manual, there's no doubt manual control. If you yeah. can do it, better than spraying Absolutely. chemicals. We, we're Especially never going to Especially in your, um, in your uh, edible foods. Yeah. It's, um, it's really them. hard to eliminate them. But what the, from what I understand with those stink bugs, those crusader bugs or the yeah. green shield bugs, that they're the ones that are most active generally around now, is they'll get in, they'll damage the new growth stem of the limes, and that's where you don't really want to see that happen. You want to see that avoided. In really bad cases, they'll affect the, the actual flowers as they're setting fruit. And, that'll and then cause, you don't get Yeah, the cause either gnarled fruit yeah. or no fruit. So yeah. you do need to act now. And, and I think um, the other thing to mention is that when we're talking about using any kind of chemical, you always have to be very careful. Um, careful on where you spray it, careful on the day you spray it and the time you spray it. So mm. you should always spray in cooler conditions, you should always avoid windy days. It doesn't matter whether you're using an insecticide, a fungicide or a herbicide, you don't want it blowing around into no. other areas because you want to treat just the plants that are being affected. 
Um, bugs, all bugs, even if they're doing damage sometimes, play an important role in the, the overall ecosystem of your garden. And yeah. the trouble or the downside to using things that are um, systemic is that it goes in, it's absorbed in through the leaves and it gets into the sap and then it flows through the whole plant and wherever they're being attacked, as soon as they come in contact with the sap, it will then kill them off. But you, the, And they tend to be effective for generally around about 14 days. You know, after that, it declines quite quickly in its um, efficacy yeah. in, the, in the actual plant itself. But, um, but you don't want to be using them too much. So 14 days is usually the life cycle of most insects. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's usually common. enough. So, so what would you use on stink bugs then? Because they, they don't come in, um, you know, you try not to, to spray when there's flowers mm, on, right? Try to you know, it. for the bees and for all the good bugs, etc. Yep. Well, I try not to spray ever. But stink bugs is something that they come in at that time mm. when you do have the buds coming out because that's what they're after. Yeah. And, and look, it is one of those challenges. I think um, there is a product from Rich Grow out there called Bug Killer, and it's the same active ah, ingredient as Comfidor, yes. but you just shake it as a thing across the ground, and it's absorbed yeah. through the uh, through the leaf, uh, through the roots instead of the leaves. And the good thing about that is, of course, at least you're not broadcasting it, and it, there's no risk of you know coming in contact. It still doesn't change the fact that it's going it's to move through systemic, the sap. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. just. It's my, my advice is wherever you can, try and be careful with how you're using those kinds of um, chemicals. The, the truth of the matter is a big, strong, robust, healthy plant will generally fight off a lot of those. They, these bugs do have a role, but um, when they get out of control, it's usually because the plants are not quite as strong as they should be. Yeah. So feeding is always an important part of what you're yeah. giving your plants. Kerry is in Perth. Um, indoor plants. And they always die on it. Um, you know, the biggest thing I find with indoor plants okay. is overwatering. Yeah. And Kerry's mentioned that. Is she overwatering her plants? Quite possibly. Um, I think that even if you've got them in a darker position, as long as it's a plant that will take a darker position, use your finger. Have it before you start um before you start watering, mm. put your finger into the soil. If the soil is moist, don't water them. Um, I've got plants that I can leave for a whole month. But you've got a plant here that you can leave for probably longer than a month. Yeah, so this yeah. this is the ZZ plant. This is the black form called Raven. It is gorgeous. The new foliage comes out green, and as it matures, it turns that black, golden, glossy sh shade. Now, yeah. the reason I showed you this is this is a plant that you would not use, and you can see how big the pot is. You would not use more than half a glass once a week. That's probably the absolute peak, all it needs. And you can see the size of it. You'd be surprised. So indoor plants, uh, less would, is better. I would actually say to you, less than half, less than a week. Yeah. Uh, sorry, more, more than, than a week. Yeah. yeah. So they can go. They can I go for weeks and weeks one, and weeks without any water. I have this one in a what we call a one thirty mil pot, so perhaps about this big, and it um, it it uh, doesn't need watering more than once a month. Yeah. So yeah. pretty tough. So me sorry. message there is less is better. I always say there's two things that kill plants. Too much love, not enough love. Yeah. It's one of the two. So it's always a, a good way to go. Barbara Zinka Tanning, she's got a mandarin tree. It's got plenty of fruit every year, but they're dry and tasteless. The mandarin next to it is fine. Is there anything I can do or do I need to pull it out? Now, there is a lot of things that you could probably do because it's probably got a little bit to do with maybe some of the mineral nutrients that are sitting in the soil. And mandarins are very hungry plants. And now is the time to be feeding them because it's setting its fruit. So adding those into the soil right yep. now, washing it in, really, really good idea. I would give it one more run. And then if you find it's still dry, maybe you do need to change that tree. And a little more often. Mm, yeah. A little more often with, with citrus is really good. Keep the And they like consistency. So yeah. keep the water consistency also. Now, Joe and I have been talking a lot. So we're over halfway through our spring season of the Garden Gurus TV series at the moment. We're back again this weekend with another episode. So here's a sneak peek of what you can expect on this week's show while we take a breath. This bed is 1.2 metres in length and it has a great depth of 30 centimetres, which means you can grow an assortment of different plants. So if you love your produce or your flowers, you can grow it in this. And it has this handy little division piece so you can keep your veggies controlled while still enjoying a bunch of flowers.
You can place it directly onto pavers, concrete or even grass with weed mat at the base to stop any pesky grass coming through. And lastly, if you're growing produce, make sure to put it in a nice sunny spot. Well, we're back and uh, I hope that you do tune in with oh, so many people across Australia to watch the next episode of The Garden Gurus. The TV series has been going for nearly 20 years now and we've never got tired of it. It's something that we just love doing and we get so much positive feedback. Speaking of positive feedback, every week we catch up with this bloke and he is one of the great guys of the garden industry, David Van Berkel is the Managing Director of Garden Express. David, welcome back to the show. I've got Joe Harris with me this morning. Hi, David. Hi, Joe. How are you going? Yeah, good, David. Thank you. How are you doing, good. mate? Yeah, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Special hello to Michaela hiding in the background there, uh, keeping is, you guys on yeah. track. We've got Michaela and Steve in with us today. So they're, hey, they're, they're driving, the, uh, driving the show for us. Um, David, um, you, you don't look like you've aged at all, but you did. How did the birthday go? The birthday went really well. It took a couple of days to have it. Uh, <laughs> young Connor just whizzed around in his chair going, he does look older. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, that's life, isn't it? It keeps marching on. But, um, mate, you brought back some memories there with the stink bug, you know, the old stink bug in the lime yeah. tree. Huh? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was wandering in my front yard the other day, 20 metres from any plants, and I could just get a waft of, uh, of stink bug happening. And yeah. I haven't had that probably for, for 15, 20 years, the old stink bugs from, certain, uh, from the harvest. Certain times of the year, um, it's certain in certain places, they really do actually have that very distinctive, you know, when they're, when they're highly active, that very distinctive odour that just cuts through everything else, doesn't it? For a tiny bug, it's a, it's a power of punch, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It absolutely is, mate. So listen, last week we, we've, well, every week we obviously show something, but last week we, um, we obviously put an offer out there, went crazy. This week you've gone to the next level. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we've been talking about colour in the garden um, so much and we've been talking about those rare and collectible plants. Um, gerberas have made a huge comeback. In fact, they're probably one of the most expensive flowers that you'd buy in the florist these days, but you can grow them at home quite successfully, can't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, gerber is once, uh, once you establish a gerber plant, it's all about getting a, a good quality plant, not something that's been raised indoors all of its life. And um, once it settles into the garden, the number of blooms you get from it, Trevor, is just incredible. Mm. What is, what's the best conditions for gerberas to grow in? They like to be not too wet and, and a good amount of airflow in it as well. You get a little bit of, uh, of disease can happen in the crown of a, of a gerbera plant and also mm -hmm. to the foliage. So a nice breezy spot is probably the best for them. Uh, plenty of sun as well, maybe a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, yep. quite, a, quite a watery stem, I suppose, in the, in the gerbera, but strong, long flowering. And as you said, just gorgeous colours, Trevor, amazing. Now, the, the flowers um, that we're seeing in florists, I mean, are, are people able to get those varieties, that standard of, of quality in garden plants as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, the breeding in, uh, in Europe for gerberas, obviously they latch on to some of these really beautiful cut flowers. And, of course, if something's got a, a long vase life, they'll put a lot more effort into it. So they've been breeding by colours, doubles, uh, there was even one on uh, on some mail this morning that they've bred, which is sort of almost dinner plate size and like a triple-double, a beautiful Good pink one. Um, so just constantly bringing in new varieties. And so what we do at Garden Express is we work through the ones that are going to be better suited to the garden, the stronger performers, um, mm -hmm. so that you translate that success of a flower grower into your into your own backyard. Have you got, uh, you got some on offer for our viewers this week? We have. We've added a couple of collections after the weekend there, Trevor. So we're up to six collections now um, okay. with, with some different shades of colours. So like a pink and white one, um, the, there you go there, the oranges, yeah. reds and yellows. I mean, the diversity of this flower is, is absolutely stunning. Yeah, they're, they're insane colours. They're just beautiful. Now, people obviously, uh, to learn more, can just head off to the Garden Express website to place your orders. But um, 
when it comes to a bit of advice, um, you've suggested nice sunny position. Gee, those colours are beautiful. Um, nice sunny positions that, that go, and obviously that that airflow really important, not just for gerberas but also for things like roses. But if you're going to put them in with something else in the garden, have you got other plants that they would go in well with, David? Look, I suppose around uh, around with lavenders and at the base of roses would be really good, you know, probably yeah. flowering at similar times, but, but certainly alongside some lavenders, would that's the type of position that you'd be looking for with them. Uh, yep, so with the plants that we're supplying, Trev? Yeah. Oh, beautiful, okay. Beautiful, sizable plants. So we, we start with a tissue culture plant, um, grow it out till the root system's really healthy, season mm -hmm. it off for a few weeks before we ship them. It's just Gee, they, they look great. Aren't they sensational? Yeah. So, so with the collections, how many have you got in each collection? So we just got three in a collection. We know that people yep. will want to choose uh, probably a couple of collections. So to to put some options there and just sort of go with your colour themes that are in your garden. Um, okay. No, normally, twenty percent. I was about to say normally you pay about forty bucks for a collection like that. So thirty dollars. Yeah, for absolutely. Yeah, and uh, and six to choose from with three plants in each collection. Have you still got okay. Rowan with you, mate? I've got Rowan beside me, yes. he's. Really? Uh, I'm just worried. It's just that you, you're selling things so cheap, you're not going to be able to afford <laughs> to pay him anymore if you keep doing this. Uh, he's the one with the purse strings, mate. I just get to make the appearances these days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, that's what you get for having a pretty face, my friend. That's good uh, value. <laughs> that's a, just that's incredible to, value. I just wanted to show off this little uh, Eucharist or Amazon lily here. Wow. Beautiful Look little flower. 50 centimetre stem. So they just put these to a discount over the weekend. I think there's only about 30 or 40 left. Uh, but this one's from my garden. So I've, I've had it flowering a little bit earlier than the bulbs that we're sending now. But that's what you could expect in about four weeks' time. They're if stunning. That's a Eucharist. Do you know what that particular, um, so that white form is called? Uh, it's just a Eucharist lily or Amazon lily is its other Amazon name. lily. Yep, Amazon. gorgeous. And they're all the white? All, all just in the white that I've seen so far, Trevor. Right. Have you seen right. others that I should be uh, interested in? Yeah, there's a nice pink out there as well. I think I've got one in my garden. I might send you a couple of bulbs over to um, to work on. How do I place my order, Trevor? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's very easy, David. All you do is go straight to gardenexpress.com.au. And they're only $30 each. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Sounds like a trade then. <laughs> Fantastic, mate. Look, so folks, if you want to get your hands on these amazing gerbera collections, straight to the Garden Express website, gardenexpress.com.au, $30 for each collection. You can see the quality of the plants, the good looking bloke that's holding them. You can't go wrong. And of course, the great thing about Garden Express is they deliver direct to your door. David, thanks so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, of your morning. You don't look like you're a day over 45, mate. It's obviously been an easy life. Yeah, too many compliments coming, mate. That's <laughs> keep, keep, keep going. <laughs> All right, see you, David. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, we need to get moving because we've got lots of questions coming through, Joe. like Julie yeah. from Kennedy in WA. WA. So her, avo her avocado tree is forming new leaves um, and has lots of flowers, but they all died off. Um, now something is eating the new leaves. Mm. Well, there's a lot of things out there eating leaves at the moment. Mm. Um, with the, the loads of flowers that have all died off, um, I wonder if that's uh, a watering issue. Well, I don't know. You, you know, know so, the, so if you're in Port Kennedy, it's, um, ooh, it's a little it's, warmer. It is, it's and it's at the... Alkaline soils. And close to the ocean. And close to the ocean yeah. with strong winds. So you've got a, two or yeah. three things there that are going to be a little bit more challenging. However, what I would say to you is that um, avocado trees, interestingly enough, their flowers are not really pollinated by bees. They're actually pollinated by flies. flies. So um, if there hasn't yeah. been a lot of fly activity and because we've been cooler, flies do tend to um, sort of build up as soon as the weather gets warm. So we haven't had that much warm weather for fly populations to build up. It might be you haven't actually been able to get the cross pollination. So you've seen the flowers fall off, but you should still, regardless, have a small number of fruit appear. So yeah. just keep your eye out for little green spots at the moment. That's all they'll be. They'll be little, just a little tiny ball uh, sitting up there in some of those flower bracts. And what you'll do is you should see them come through. The, the new leaves, um, at the moment, I've got a bit of a skeletizing um, yes. grub. So it's coming yeah. from the diamond moth. 
So I have diamond moths that have been affecting my kale and I didn't treat them. It's not an easy one to treat. And I've noticed that some of them have moved across to the lower leaves of my avocado trees. So I did have to treat them. And what I did was instead of using a chemical, I just used a chili garlic spray and Again, I put a bit yeah. of a bit of extra olive oil in there when I mixed it up and For sprayed it, it and nicely. it really stuck. And, and yeah. I'm not seeing anything else happen. So yeah. I reckon olive oil, chili, garlic, you can make the spray yourself, mix it up, spray it over the foliage, try and spray underneath as well, because that's where the little the little grubs are actually coming up through the bottom. And hopefully that will help you out. And maybe just some um, around, if you're really close to the ocean in Kennedy, then mm -hmm. I would maybe make some a protection, protection around. Protection screen if, if it's, it's a small a young tree. tree. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Yeah. Vera, I'm not sure where you're from. Um, this is a good question, Jo. Mm. You stop figs from coming out at this time of the year and uh, where they end up is not edible. You know, the first figs sometimes will, will come out and they'll be dry. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a bit of an unusual thing, but it is a natural thing. Um, you could just pick them off because you know that's the next crop that'll come through yeah. will will actually be really big plump figs, and and I reckon that's yeah. the best advice. Yeah, I would just give. pick them off. Yeah. definitely. Kay's in Jinjin in WA, which is sort of north of the Perth metropolitan area. My tomato plants are getting black spots and marks on the leaves, and the yeah. leaves are going yellow. Is there anything I can do other than pull the affected leaves off the plant? So uh, I spent a lot of time uh, growing tomatoes uh, yes. when I was uh, back in my nursery days we used to graft them and that black spot is something called pseudomonas which is actually a bacteria yes. and it's spread by water so the trick at the moment is to get good airflow through ideally have warmer days definitely never water at night and this is a rule that you should use for yeah. any of your plants to be quite honest yeah better to water early in the morning yeah. but if you leave if you leave them wet overnight um, you will get those black spots and then the leaves will turn yellow and eventually they'll drop off. My advice, pull those leaves off. You can treat it with Mancozep. It will help a little bit. But, but not completely. Not completely. Um, we didn't bring the, the, we haven't really brought a lot of tomato plants into the nursery yet. Mm -hmm. uh, until we get that consistently warm weather, yep. a lot of people don't know how to manage the tomatoes and this is what's happening. Mm. Okay. Well, look, I'll tell you what, we've gone through a lot of questions, Joe. I think we're going to have to pull it up here. Um, that's all we've really got for today's session. Thanks so much wow. for coming in. My pleasure. Will you look after the chair for me next week? I would like to try and look after the chair. You'll do a good week. job. <laughs> Folks, um, I'm going to get Joe to come in next week because I'm taking a week off. I'm taking my lovely wife to Norfolk Island because uh, oh. we had the pleasure of filming there earlier this year. It was magnificent. And I want to go and hike through those Norfolk Island pines and enjoy the environment, maybe do a bit of diving. It should be a lot of fun. So I'm going to take a week off. Joe's going to take over for me. Um, if we didn't get to your questions today, we're very sorry, but we will answer them. We will be putting them in the log, so stay tuned, keep watching, and we will make sure that we fix it. Michaela, who has been incredibly patient with us today, as she always is, um, she is going to let you know, or she's let me know, I should say, who the winners of these amazing Osmocote products are. So the 500 grams, congratulations to Barbara, from Katanning in WA. That's right down in the Great Southern. It's a beautiful part of the world. And the one kilo, this goes to Ellie from Adelaide. Thanks so much for your questions. Everybody, thank you so much for participating um, with the show again today. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope that you got some good information. The Garden Gurus is back on Saturday. We're playing at different times at the moment around the country. We kind of bounce around the sporting events that go on, yeah. but it doesn't seem to matter because you always check your local guides and support us. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Remember, you can always jump onto our website and catch up on previous stories from the Garden Gurus TV show, or you can use it as a resource for information. It is thegardengurus.tv, or you can check out our YouTube channel, thegardengurus.tv. It's that easy. You can also listen back, and this is what Joe, we were talking about this earlier yeah. on. You can actually listen to everything that we've done today on your favourite podcast, a Spotify, Apple Podcast, Audible. We do run this as a podcast. It's become incredibly popular. Joe's going to be back with you next Monday for another session of The Garden Gurus Live at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, 9 a.m. for WA viewers. Happy gardening. Joe. thanks for joining yeah. us. Happy gardening, everyone. I you hope take it's a care. great week. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody. 
This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.